it's Huck. And never mind if you hear the coffee pot brewing, uh, you know, Huck's got to have his brew. Anyway, I got to tell you, it is with a heavy heart that I lament the rise and fall of Anthony Weiner. Because, like an awful lot of other progressives out there, Weiner first came to my attention during the whole health care debate in Congress in 2009, when he stood up, like few others in Congress, to champion the idea of universal health care, when all the talk shifted to the Republican idea of a for-profit, market-driven, insurance company-based solution, a national Romney care plan and its individual mandate. And not only was Weiner and maybe former Ohio Congressman Dennis Kucinich about the only two progressive voices seemingly willing to fight for a government-run single-payer system, or failing that at least a government-run public option to compete with the insurance industry, Weiner could be found standing in the well of Congress saying so as loudly and as obnoxiously as possible. They are a wholly owned subsidiary of the insurance industry. That's the fact. And Mr. now Speaker, they stand Mr. up Speaker, and say that... Mr. Speaker, I ask the gentleman words be taken down. Oh. You really don't want to go here, Mr. Lundgren. The gentleman will suspend. The gentleman from New York will please take a seat. I Make no mistake me. about it, every single Republican I have ever met in my entire life is a wholly owned subsidiary of the insurance industry. That is why Americans... Mr. Speaker, I ask the gentleman's words be taken down once more. I will suspend. From New York, will please take Enough a seat. Enough of the phoniness. We are going to solve this problem because for years our Republican friends have been unable to and unwilling to deal with it. In 1935 when there was the Social Security Act and we decided we weren't going to allow 30 percent of seniors to slip into poverty, Democrats proposed, Democrats passed, Republicans opposed Social Security. In 1965 when Medicare was passed, Democrats proposed, Democrats supported, Republicans opposed, and now Medicare is a factor. This life. is what members of Congress get. This is a guidebook with affordable health care plans, many choices, deep discounts because we pull people together, minimum standards for each plan. This is what members of Congress get, but they don't want you, the American people, to get it. This is what it's about. The Democrats want this for you, and the Republican parties just wants it for themselves. I yield back the balance of my time. Speaker <laughs> said, very simply under the cut goal rule, if it is your intention to create a new government program, you must also terminate or reduce spending on an existing government program. We can't simply say, because it's a favorite program of the Speaker, we're going to waive the rules. The gentleman will state his parliamentary... Is it not the rules of the House that under Clause 10A of Rule 21, what the Speaker articulated in this sentence is in fact the rule? rule does not support a point of order at this stage in the debate. The rule exists, but we don't need to follow it. I withdraw my parliamentary inquiry. The gentleman is untimely. The question... The, the point is that the gentleman is untimely in his point of order. The gentleman will state his parliamentary It's inquiry. a simple question. Does the rule stipulated here exist? And is the only reason we're not following it is I didn't get to the floor in time? Chair, it will not respond to critical commentary. The question is on the engrossment and third reading of the bill. Those in favor will signify by saying aye. Mr. Speaker, I yield one minute to the distinguished gentleman from New York, Mr. Weiner. Gentleman's recognized. Great courage. Wait until all members have already spoken and then stand up and wrap your arms around procedure. We see it in the United States Senate every single day where members say, we want amendments, we want debate, we want amendment, but we're still a no. And then we stand up and say, oh, if only we had a different process, we'd vote yes. You vote yes if you believe yes. You vote in favor of something if you believe it's the right thing. If you believe it's the wrong thing, you vote no. We are following a procedure. I will not yield to the gentleman, and the gentleman will observe regular order. The gentleman will observe regular order. The gentleman thinks that if he gets up and yells on him, he's going to intimidate people into believing he's right. He is wrong. The gentleman is wrong. 
The gentleman is providing cover for his colleagues rather than doing the right thing. It's Republicans wrapping their arms around Republicans rather than doing the right thing on behalf of the heroes. It is a shame, a shame. If you believe this is a bad idea to provide health care, then vote no. But don't give me the cowardly view that, oh, if it was a different procedure, the gentleman will observe regular order and sit down. I will not. The gentleman will sit. The gentleman is correct in sitting. And if saying these things in Congress, at the heart of the most reviled institution in America, were not enough, he also said so repeatedly, even in the heart of the most reviled media empire in the world. Who are going to get taxed again with a big inheritance tax. 35% is where it's going to go. Many of the Democrats wanted it to go to 55%. How much is enough of a dead man's estate uh, to take away from his uh, widow and from his children? First of all, this idea that government's taking something, let's not get carried away. All taxation to some degree is an agreement we all make that there are some communal things we need to pay for, and we're, it's just a matter of how we'd, we figure out how to pay for right. them. Right, I agree. But the, question is, but the question is very simply this. When someone gets money via an inheritance or a lottery, or wins it at a casino, but doesn't work for it. Do you believe that should be taxed at a lower rate than someone who works 70 hours a week on a construction site? At no, a lower I, rate? Do you no, believe here's, that? Here's no, what I do, believe. Nor do I, nor did Ronald no, Reagan, nor did Teddy Roosevelt. I don't believe that you should pay taxes on that. the Who is a lobbyist. And what he said on that tape is who that his wife... Can I, can I have my turn? Sure. Okay. Because what because he said on that tape is... is that oh, state, I thought I could have my turn. Uh, okay, I thought I was getting my turn question. now. Where's my turn? Well, uh, listen, what I'm he not, said in that sure tape is that he believes in liberty and his wife believes in liberty. And what's happened in the past to very left-leaning groups, in, and actually uh, speaking to groups that had cases on abortion, an ethical otherwise. obligation that they will okay, step down and they don't need now. politicians like of the to give press speeches. pushing I, I know on you them. Like giving, I know you like giving speeches, but you're doing an interview. I got 20 so seconds against a hard break. Go ahead. What's the question? Well, you, you, you I heard the speech. Right, What's forget. the question? I got to go, Congressman. Thank you so much for coming on. All Great the best interview. To you. Aces. <laughs> Thanks so much. Say what you will about Wiener, that he failed to produce any significant legislation during his congressional tenure. Fifty bills introduced, one passed. That he turned a blind eye toward anything even remotely controversial involving Israel. That he at times leveled the same kind of outrage and passion with his staff as with his opponents. In the end, what progressive liberals like me loved most about Wiener was that he was a fighter. And he fought for a lot of progressive causes, not just health care. Wiener was never the perfect progressive. He voted to approve too many trade agreements to sit well with me, but the fact is Few members of Congress boasted a more progressive voting record on issues involving a woman's right to choose, issues of equality and gay rights, issues related to a separation of church and state, on sensible gun reform, on opposition to the death penalty, opposition to mandatory sentencing law, on strengthening, even expanding, Medicare and Social Security, on public education, on green energy, progressive tax reform, opposition to the Patriot Act, reducing the size and cost of the military. On each of these topics, not just health care, Wiener always came to the debate well armed for the progressive position, with hard facts and legitimate studies. You could not trip him on any of these subjects. He stuck to the facts, and woe to the wicked who attempted to sideline the debate with misinformation or some other nonsense. Now, some have criticized Wiener for ultimately giving up his fight for a Medicare for all plan, and his call for a public option, accepting a prominent public speaking role in return for his vote. But remember, by that time, Wiener's battle had already been lost. And as for putting him front and center, well, what they don't tell you is that benefited most Democrats, not just Wiener himself. Because he drew donations to the Democratic cause, like Paul Rand draws members of the white power movement. And Wiener drew that money because we like fighters, especially when what they fight for is the best possible policy. Sadly, 
time and time again. How many times have we asked ourselves, what the hell President Obama and Senate Majority Leader Harry Reid are doing trying to find compromise or common ground with a Neanderthal-thinking, obstructionist-committed Republican Party? It'd be different if they would meet us halfway, but they never do. What we relished when we saw Wiener fighting for progressive causes is what we knew to be true all along, that if you fight for what you truly believe in, what you know to be right, the American people are not stupid and they'll largely take your side. Instead, Democrats caved to a largely Republican health care solution only to see, in the end, that the whole process hijacked by a couple of Koch brother funded corporate shill organizations, FreedomWorks, and Americans for Prosperity now trying to repeal the whole damn thing. These lying, deceitful, multi-million dollar Koch brother organizations, even today, are flaunting the absurdity of their tax-exempt status by throwing the full weight of their political motives and actions into a myriad of libertarian think tanks like the Cato Institute and the Institute for Humane Studies and at least 34 different Tea Party groups around the country. And whether we're talking about universal health care, sensible gun reform, or global climate change and the need for green energy alternatives, the American people, even the most Republican voters, aren't really interested in compromise as much as they are interested in doing the right thing. On health care, Republicans have not given an inch. For seven months now this year, the very rich have seen income taxes for the first time imposed on their dividend income. All that's going to go a long way toward paying for Obamacare. Well, that's already been in place. Those taxes have been coming out since January. And Richard and David Koch are pissed. Really pissed. Remember that David Koch, as a libertarian candidate for vice president just a few decades ago, campaigned to completely abolish Social Security, the FBI, the CIA, even public schools. We hear a lot of similar talk now, all throughout the Republican Party both in state and federal capitals. The Kochs have been working to undermine or eliminate Medicare and Medicaid relentlessly. And his minions, elected to state offices in the Republican Party, have done his bidding well. Most red states in this country have rejected the expansion of Medicaid, as outlined in Obamacare, even though it amounts to a windfall in related funding for these states. Well, these same red states have not budged to work on the menu of state-approved insurance exchanges which are to be in place by this October for startups in January. In Congress, Republicans have now voted 37 times to repeal all or significant parts of the Affordable Care Act. And now, with full implementation of the law just months away, Knowing that millions of Americans are about to discover for themselves how affordable and beneficial this new law actually is, Republicans have sunk to a new depth of desperation. They are threatening to shut down the government by refusing to fund it past September 30th if Obamacare is not defunded completely. And it is times like this when we most miss Anthony Weiner in Congress or at least the Anthony Weiner we thought we knew. No one was more disappointed than I when news first surfaced in June of 2011 that Weiner was apparently engaged in sexting young female Twitter followers. And no one was more devastated to hear him lie about it until finally the jig was up and he resigned his seat. Now, for some folks, particularly young folks, None of this may seem that big a deal. He didn't break any law by sexting these women. Didn't really do anything hundreds of thousands of others, mostly teens, haven't done themselves. And for some foreign observers, this may still seem like much ado about relatively nothing. Hell, for some foreign leaders, showing a little skin is all part of the grand marketing scheme. 
But Wiener is not 15 years old. And unlike France or Russia, America still holds fast to some of its Puritan roots. But even saying all that, there is something more disturbing in all this. Whether it is a type of perverse thrill addiction, as some suggest, or something else, I don't know. But what I do know is it is his willingness to use deception, to lie, even to the extent of spending tens of thousands of dollars of his own campaign funds to falsely investigate what he knew all along to be true. This to me is where I draw the line. Sure, a lot of folks lie about sex. Hell, maybe I would too if I thought anyone would believe I ever got any, but well, I can forgive and forget the knee-jerk reflex to lie in the immediate aftermath of a sex scandal, I cannot justify his spending the hard-earned dollars of supporters who contributed to his campaign in an attempt to cover up the truth. Elliot Spitzer, another Democrat, who fell from grace, took five years off after resigning as governor before announcing his bid for another office, this time a less glamorous but carefully thought out an economically significant position of New York City Comptroller. Unlike Wiener, it took just seven days from his prostitute scandal to come to light before Spitzer apologetically resigned his office of governor. And unlike Wiener, Spitzer has kept his nose seemingly clean ever since. And the American public, generally forgiving, will almost certainly reward him this fall with a landslide win for that comptroller post. Personally, I like Anthony Weiner. He reminds me, in some ways, of myself. I was never one to go meekly into the dark night without having my say, and at times, I have paid for my unwillingness to stay silent when discretion may have been the better part of valor. It has cost me a few jobs along the way, for one thing. I sincerely wish Anthony Weiner well, and I do think he may have been a terrific New York mayor who really would fight for the little guy effectively. It's quite possible, but not now. Not when the offenses and the pain and disappointment it fosters is so fresh. Anthony Weiner can be thankful for two things. That at least for now he has the love and support of a very bright, extraordinary wife and the promise of a young child they together can nurture. My suggestion to Mr. Weiner would be that he should concentrate on those two most important aspects of his life with the same passion and resolve that he displayed toward progressive causes as a politician and put aside any and all thought about his political future. Clearly, a 2013 run for mayor so hard on the heels of such family and public betrayal was too impulsive. And if Wiener has a real problem, it seems to me it's one of controlling his impulses. For now, he should just concentrate on doing the right thing for the right reasons for the two most important people in his life. I'm Huck. Thanks for watching. I'll see you again on Wednesday.